our results indicated that uh, providing, you know, in addition to nine, li because it's a high, because we give the one of the highest volume of milk, which is nine liters. Even, even though calves had nine liters of milk, they still drink one liter of additional water from the bucket. We call free water. The other is the diet bound water. So then the free water from the open bucket, like up around one liter of the, so the, oh, that one liter is now going to the rumen, right? So they drank. And then um, contrary to what farmers believe, uh, providing drinking water actually increased the milk consumption. Hello, welcome back to the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Barry Bradford from Michigan State University. Today I'm happy to welcome Dr. Ranga Apuhami from Iowa State University uh, as our guest on the show. So briefly, I'll give some background on Ranga. He is a native of Sri Lanka. He ended up doing his master's and PhD work at Virginia Tech before completing postdoctoral uh, residencies at the University of Guelph and then at University of California, Davis. Uh, before he joined the faculty at Iowa State University about seven years ago. Uh, he has a research and teaching position there at Iowa State. Uh, he's co-authored more than 60 peer-reviewed publications. Um, and today, uh, we're looking forward to talking with Dr. Apuhami. So thanks for joining us, Ranga. Thank you for the invitation, Barry. So real briefly, what classes do you teach for that part of your job there at Iowa State? So I teach um, Animal Science 319, that is our introductory animal nutrition class um, at Iowa State. So I, uh, so we offer this class both spring and fall semesters. And I teach um, this course in the, in the spring semester and um, Lance Baumgart teach the same class in the fall semester. So um, at the Student enro enrollment varies between 140 to 160 students in the spring semester. And I teach uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like each time it's a 50 minute lecture. Yeah. And I also teach um, the um, uh, ruminant uh, digestive physiology and metabolism class for graduate student in every other spring semester. So the spring semester is a busy teaching semester for me. And the fall semester, I teach uh, two graduate classes depending on the student enrollment. If we have good enrollment, we offer those two classes. One is advanced protein nutrition and um, crop and livestock integrated farming system, which is a, a cross-listed be um, uh, between animal science and sustainable agriculture um, graduate programs. So yeah, and I also guest lecture uh, in our introductory dairy science class and um, the uh, senior level de uh, uh, dairy system management class covering the, all the nutrition topics. So they cover different topics, reproduction, nutrition. So I, I, I guest lecture on the nutrition topics. And in addition to all those teaching, I do student advising, undergraduate student advising is part of my teaching responsibility in the department. So currently I have 39, 39 uh, undergraduates, student advice. So that's pretty much my teaching <laughs> responsibility. So you get touch points with students all the way from uh, entering college, you know, just, just yeah. starting freshman year all the way up to fourth year PhD student and yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, undergraduate and actually I have three um, graduate student at to whom I'm the major advisor, and also I, I'm a co-major advisor for another graduate student. Okay. So that's a Typical fresh cow incidence of clinical hypocalcemia is 3 to 6%, while subclinical hypocalcemia affects 50% or more mature cows. Based on cutting-edge research, Exelite offers a new approach that is build effective and the ZDUs. For more information, visit www.protecta.com. I don't know about you, but I think one of my favorite parts of this kind of job is just watching people mature and evolve and yeah, grow yeah. in that window of time. Yeah, it's 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 um it's very 
fulfilling to see that my undergraduate student advice is joining as my graduate <laughs> advice is, or even there's some undergraduate research uh, project. So that's, uh, that's, you know, kind of, you know, getting more closer in terms of mentoring from undergraduate to graduate level. Yeah. Absolutely. So what about your own journey? What, what drew you into animal science or dairy science in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I'm from a country that doesn't have a dairy si- dairy industry, very organized industry, but right. we had a good agriculture program, I mean, like undergraduate agriculture program. So I I um, did my bachelor's degree in agriculture at a leading university in Sri Lanka called University of Peradeniya. So it was a four-year agriculture degree program and then we were given an opportunity to uh, select a, spe- a specialization topic in the last two years. So I chose animal science um, because I, I uh, honestly, I didn't like the management, but I did like the physiology part um, because, you know, first year it was more like a management. And then second year, we, I was exposed to uh, this uh, physiology based knowledge in animal science. So that kind of, you know, kind of, I felt like, oh, this is very interesting because it's like a learning about our body too, right? So, yeah, exactly. so then I I thought, okay, specialization in animal science should be my topic. So then I chose that topic during the last two years. And part of um, uh, the kind of, you know, degree requirement uh, was to complete an undergraduate research thesis. So the last six years, uh, we were given a, um, a super research supervisor. Um, the conversation between the supervisor and student kind of decide on what topic they want to, you know, study further. So the my um, um, research at undergraduate research advisor was graduated from University of Arizona. Um, in in US and he was in, in dairy technology. He was in more like a dairy yogurt and you know dairy food technology. However, he gave me a topic like to study the efficiency of a bucket milking machine that we use for used to milk local local cattle breed, local cows. So that was very interesting um, the topic because the machine was designed for European, like a bus tourist, but now we are using that for bus indicators and not this efficiency. How can improve the efficiency, the pulsation rates, and how we can change the, the teat cup design to increase the efficiency, those kind of things. So it's very interesting. And working with cows was very, int- uh, you know, I enjoy that. But it's, it's, I mean, like, you know, when I work with hostings now, they're like, they are very cooperative, but in boss indicators are not that cooperative. But it, but it has its own own difficulties. But but it is still it was it was a good experience. And then because of the the during thesis writing, I happened to um, refer to Journal of Dairy Science. We have several journal, volumes of Journal of Dairy Science in our in our university library, and reading those. I mean, I was fascinated by the work uh, published in the Journal of Dairy Science, and I wanted to do some research to that level one day. I think that was one of the kind of, you know, stimuli I had during undergraduate program. And also uh, um, two of our nutrition professors were graduate, I mean, had um, graduate school experience and obtained PhD uh, from Virginia Tech. And my genetics and breeding professor obtained his PhD from Iowa State, and then my reproductive and lactation physiology teacher also had a graduate school experience in US. So all I mean, listening to their stories in dairy science research also kind of you know steam, you know planted the dairy science research interest in my mind. I think altogether, I think that's how I started my kind of interest in dairy science and also particularly do dairy science research in U.S. actually. Right. Yeah. So that, and then that's not easy. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, I I'm, I'm like to get some experience in the U.S. doing research. It doesn't mean you can find an opportunity, right? So how did that come about? Yeah. Yeah. So now all those 
professors were graduated like 20, 25 years before I graduated. At that time, I think the the graduation rate was very less and the um, U.S. aid program, because United States, um, some, um, you know, the U.S. government had a program that helped in developing countries. They provided a lot of graduate um, scholarship those days. So my teacher said that sometimes the university administration came to office and offered, oh, there are some opportunities come because that that much kind of, you know, you know, availability of scholarship that when I was graduating, there's, that program was already done. There's, then we have to find the assistantship or the placement by ourselves. Nobody is there to offer us any opportunity. So after graduating, I joined another university. It's a newly established university called Wyambo University as a lecturer in animal science. So I taught uh, animal nutrition, animal genetics and breeding, meat science, variety of classes to undergraduate students. And I always wanted to graduate studies and also my job requires a graduate degree for any promotion. So I signed up for a, a master's program in animal science in a postgraduate institute, institute of agriculture in Sri Lanka. So I took several classes, but I realized that I was not making much progress or advancement in terms of knowledge compared to what I already had during my um, undergraduate degree. I thought maybe I want to try a foreign university, particularly English speaking countries for the sake of, you know, comfort, comfort and easiness. And then in language wise. So then I um, started uh, looking for opportunities in um, US, Australia, UK and Canada. So in animal science programs, then and also my goal was to obtain admission with assistantship, obviously. So then I, in addition to applying for the, uh, the usual um, admission route, I also started emailing professors like um, describing why I'm applying, why I'm interested in dairy science and what kind of impact that uh, the a prospective graduate program would have my life as well as the community or society. So that's my like, you know, um, statement of purpose. So yeah, so then I started applying sometimes five, 10 professors per week. I had a goal to contact. And then one day, um, Dr. Bennett Cassell, um, who uh, was a genetist and extension uh, professor uh, in the dairy science department at Virginia Tech, replied uh, quite positively. Um, he had uh, like five, six questions, six questions for me to answer. Like again, so why, why Virginia Tech and why dairy science and what kind of textbook and what kind of genetics and breeding classes you have taken and who are the teachers and their background and some, I remember. Then I, I and also he asked at the second email, he has some few recommendation letters. So then I, then the teachers, I think I was a little bit of an intelligent wise enough to ask recommendation letters from teachers who graduated from Virginia Tech or, or had some graduate school experience or research experience in United States. So they provided those recommendations and I think they they helped a lot in uh, obtaining the admission and also the also the research assistantship with Dr. Bennett Castle. So that is how I ended up um, in the science department at Virginia Tech for master. That's fantastic. A lot of persistence, a lot of passion. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Good for you. Okay, well, let's let's talk a little bit about what you've been working on lately. Um, so you're, you, you know, two thirds of your job at Iowa State is research, and I know you've got an active program there. But I understand lately you've been working um, a little bit on the importance of drinking water for young calves. Can how did you get on this? Because I know you've done all kinds of you know, advanced nutrition work. And this seems, you know, frankly, it seems like, oh, yeah, water. They need water, right? Yeah. I didn't know it happened. Um, so this is how it actually um, began. So when I was a postdoc at UC Davis, 
So that is where I started working on water. So I, I developed um, a mechanistic model or set of equations to describe, you know, water intake, absorption and partitioning water in lactating cows. And so, and then with, with that work, I, I mean, I garnered some attention as somebody working on this weird kind of um, unforgotten nutrient. And then at the same time, um, the Paul Kananoff also was working on some water related topics and he wanted to collaborate and um, he had a data set um, about, uh, and he wanted, I think he was also working on the water chapter of the new NRC. Uh, so, and then, uh, so we were collaborated um, uh, in a project um, where we developed new equations to predict water intake of lactating and dry cows and also evaluated existing equations uh, using uh, modern cow data. So that's our project and we publish a paper in JDS. And, um, and then we also wanted to develop an equation to predict water intake of calves and heifers, but then, then realized that there's no enough data in the literature. So that is something that's, I think that's the inception of, you know, my um, interest to work more on water intake of calves, knowing that usually even scientists, we do not, a nutritionist, we do not even report, even though we measure, we do not report thinking, oh, it's not that important, or oh, we do not measure, or oh, we measure but do not report, or some way there's, well, there's a um, little amount of data in the scientific literature. At the same time, I think that is the time that we had this 100-year review articles in Journal of Dairy Science, Centennial, review articles about proteins, fat, and calf nutrition. So then the um, Al Kurtz, um, Jim Quigley, uh, um, Jim Drakeley, they published this 100-year um, review article on dairy calf management and nutrition and emphasizing in chap saying like not much data about water of uh, newborn cows. So. Uh, I think it's the same time. That was 2017. So that is the um, But I think the article was in press in 2016. So, and then the same 2016, the USDA published their um, data on the um, dairy health and monitoring survey, which emphasized that um, the farmers wait more than two weeks to offer drinking water to, to calves, assuming that... Um, the water in milk and milk replace is enough to fulfill the total requirement of some farmers thinks of providing water in winter time is very hard, you know, freezing to yes, that is understandable. And also um, you can introduce pathogens to the digestive tract and um, um, intensify diarrhea or um, providing water may decrease milk or milk replacer consumption. So there are some reasons for that. I mean, those are all reasons are valid. And then I really wanted to test all those, uh, all those, the notions that never been tested in a systematic research. Uh, because the last time we uh, studied the significance of water in our neonatal calves was in 1984, that Alcott's paper. And since then we were kind of, you know, murdered in that paper, like in every uh, extension article. But then our modern cows are very much different from 1984. We provide a lot of high volume of milk replace and milk. maybe farmers were correct. I wanted to know uh, what it is. And then, yeah, that is that is how that, that all the water work started, yes. Wow, so talk me through like a couple of key experiments you've done. Cause there's, you mentioned a lot of variables there, right? You, I, I'm guessing you couldn't test all those variables at once. What, what have you asked yeah, for? We had two experiments in kind of a two topics. So one for the, First topic, um, the experiments, we were looking at the uh, significance or the impact of offering drinking water to neonatal calves on, um, again, the milk consumption, that is 
farmers think that can decrease, right? And then the scarver scores, because farmers think that it can intensify the scarver scores. And then also definitely growth and development. Development wise, it's a room and development was our main focus because uh, the water in the milk and milk replace is directly shunted to the post-ruminal compartment because milk is directly shunted through the esophageal groove closure. Right. But the drinking water gets a chance to enter the rumen and be a part of the rumen, which is important for the fermentation, the providing them a, that aqueous medium uh, to for the fermentation reactions, uh, which is a stimuli for rumen development. So we, I mean, this is not something I developed hypothesis. It has been there even for a long time, but we never tested. And then I did not directly test it because I did this first, that was not a terminal study. I didn't slaughter animals or get the rumen. But instead, I, I measured the total tract digestibility of fiber as a proxy for, for the rumen development. So, and then our results indicated that uh, providing, you know, in addition to nine, li- because it's a high, because we gave the one of the highest volume of milk, which is nine liters. Even even though calves had nine liters of milk, they still drink one liter of additional water from the bucket. We call free water. The other is the diet bound water. So then the free water from the open bucket, like around one liter of the, so the, that one liter is now going to the rumen, right? So they drank. And then um, contrary to, what farmers believe, uh, providing drinking water actually increased the milk consumption. The the calves um, having access to drinking water drank 300 milliliters more milk. They had less milk refusals. Uh, That is enough. They they weren't ad libitum, but some of them didn't drink the nine liters. But okay, I see. And then um, no difference in scarver scores or haptoglobin um the blood heptoglobin concentration that we measure weekly uh, through as a measure of inflammation um, right. inflammation or general health status and in yep. and um and then the the there was a tendency that calves had voted during their neonatal stage reach uh, to reach a, a higher body weight at weaning and then the fiber digestibility improved both ndf and area when we measure two weeks after post weaning you use total feces collect like a total collection method um and then so we follow up those calves uh, to five months of age and then again at five months of age they had achieved higher body weights and hip heights the, the, the calves receive. I feel, I think everything is centered on the the post feeding performance. May be centered on the the rumen develop, improved rumen development and the efficiency of uh, feed efficiency. Um, wow, that's impressive. So when you say they drink a liter of water, is that average over the six weeks? Uh, oh, it's before? average over the three first three weeks. First three weeks. So they, you have measurable water intake in the first week, even. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And also this is again, again, when we provide these nine liters of milk, but that is like a high end in the commercial farm. On average, it is six, li- six liters. But I think it, I feel like they would drink more close to two, two liters. I mean, like you know, if you take out some water from the diet, they may drink more water from, uh, from, from the, from the bucket. Yeah. So by, I'm assuming that you weaned around six weeks. I don't know that, but yes, yes, six weeks partial weaning, seven week complete weaning. Yes. So by that time, when they're obviously they're eating more starter and everything, how much water were they drinking by that point? Um. So that is another thing. Like, um, once we wean, you know, because now we are giving this high plane of nutrition, right? Nine liters of milk. So they eat zero, almost zero start actually in our experiments. But now once we cut down that nine liters to three liters, that's the partial weaning on 42nd day, uh, like six weeks of age. Now they are increasing the start intake from zero to 300 grams. So now that is means now the rumen is receiving large amount of uh, fermentable substrate 
the rumen is not that developed absorptive capacity I've, uh, but I, I think that can create as acidosis you know some level of acidosis because at, but you see that uh, the then cows drink huge amount of drinking water on first few days of that partial weaning i'm I, my hypothesis is that it is the it is the because cows tend to drink more water to maintain that desired osmolarity because it's a huge solid uh, amount of solute is produced now in the room and and then d- start intake continue to increase but this uh, the water intake reach a peak like the fourth day of weaning and start to go down it like i think that that the 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 increase in water intake it's more like a, more like a try to try to maintain that um you know it's giving some dilution to solutes that which is um the produce uh, abruptly um in the room and i think providing enough drinking water at weaning particularly when we a uh, wean calves from a high plane of nutrition is also critical. It is something I, I'm, I'm, the, my, the I reason is, I mean, I submitted a USDA grant recently, so it's one of the topics I want to study more about the, the role of water in weaning um, during the step down weaning of, from a high milk volume. So, so a lot of farms I think would have maybe a, say a two gallon bucket and they could maybe typically put four or five liters or a little more in the drinking bucket. And I think a lot of farms might do that once a day. Some do twice a day. Is that enough? Like is five liters a day enough at a, in a partway through weaning? Um, let me see. Um, five liters a day should be enough. Yeah. Okay. Should, yeah. Be enough. should be enough. Yeah. Just curious. So what about, what's the second experiment then that you've conducted? Experiments is the other uh, effect of, the the drinking water on the gut microbiota composition. So we use a, fe- a fecal microbiome as a proxy for the whole gut microbiome. Um, we couldn't explain, okay, it, the, whatever the changes were in the rumen or the small, it is just the whole gut microbiome. So the our results indicated that the the provision of drinking water increased the species richness. Now, means a number of bacterial species in the in the feces, and among those bacteria, we particularly saw an uh, increased abundance of uh, uh, fecalibacterium uh, presinitsi. It's a, like a very uh, popular um, bacterial species in most of the probiotics. Is this and then also Bifidobacterium brevi, another another um, beneficial like you know it's improved gut health and gut development, villus high to creep ratio, and then the immune um, the characteristics. So so that is, but all those improvements were limited to the pre weaning. When we we also had a post weaning fecal samples, and then when we analyzed that, there's no difference between. Um, the calves received water or who did not receive water that indicate that weaning not indicate actually to verify the previous finding that the weaning is the most powerful um, where, uh, kind of you know event or variable like a shaping up the microbiota composition of because no other factor can dictate that the what weaning um, does to the microbiota composition. In calves, yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Wow, fascinating. So it, it's incredible to me, though, that um, just providing water from immediately postnatal can actually influence fiber digestion two months later, basically, right? Yeah, because, you know, that uh, because the, there's a microbiome even at the one hour after birth, right? In the yeah, right. Crack. So, um, yeah, I think water, it, drinking water can create a some anaerobic environment to, you know, I don't, maybe it's some physiological, the, the temperature can, um, the water can change the room and temperature, maybe redox um, potential, osmolarity, all can affect the room and development in different ways. Yeah. So just the simple forgotten nutrient can have, have a lot of effects, right? <laughs> maybe a good way to, uh, um, 
develop some cost effective strategies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't have to pay much for that. So uh, thinking about the practicalities of it, you did a good job of mentioning some of the concerns and you experimentally addressed some of them. Um, if you've talked with producers, I'm sure somebody has asked you, okay, Mr. Fancy professor. Um, so how, how am I going to give my, how am I going to give drinking water to my calves uh, in January then? Now, do you have, Thoughts on just the simple problem of freezing? <laughs> yes, um, in freezing temperature. I mean, we had an experiment in, you know, in in a hutch uh, outside hutches um, in um, uh, December where, where the it was freezing temperatures. In the morning, they, there's a layer of um, the um, the frozen water, but during daytime when you refill um with uh, the tap water that it it, it stay uh, the liquid for some uh because now dairy cows drink 40 percent of their water uh total water intake within two hours after the morning feeding like after a meal oh, yeah. so right, yeah. um, we have not we i don't know similar figure for dairy calves but i think if you when you provide refill the grain you can also refill the the bucket, so I think the majority of water will be, the calves will drink majority of water right after having the first meal. So if you have liquid water uh, that, that period of time, even though the temperature is freezing, I think that it that it is going to be helpful. That's a really good point. So even if some of it freezes later, it doesn't mean it was a waste to offer some water, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, you can keep working on that problem. You can violate the laws of thermodynamics or something. Okay, well, thanks. I think, I mean, what's great about that research is, is it's it's interesting. You, you've thought through in great depth in terms of the physiology impacted by the animal, and yet the practical implications are very clear, right? And it's and it leads to very clear management advice. Uh, so I love that. I appreciate that. It's time for our famous three. When it comes to raising healthy animals, you need more than the right solutions. You need the right partner who brings decades of industry expertise and a global team to put that knowledge to work for the advancement of your operation. At Fibro Animal Health Corporation, we are proud to work with you as your trusted partner. I've got to throw our three questions at you that we throw at every guest and uh, always learn something from these, so I appreciate it. So first of all, what's your favorite dairy-related book or resource, Ranga? <laughs> I think it's more like a resource than a book. I like NRCO, Nissan publication. That's my Bible for research and sometimes to teaching when it comes to graduate classes. So that's for sure. And I also refer, to, I mean, like a journal of dairy science is something I always kind of depend upon up, up to date knowledge. And when it comes to like a teaching fundamental, you know, the introductory classes, I go for textbooks like, you know, you know the church or the Jennings, it has, so then those textbooks, yeah. Good books. And for, for those of you who are not dairy nutritionists, the, the NRC or the NASM that you hear talked about, that's the uh, Nutrient Requirements of Dairy Cattle published by the National Academies Press. And so, yes, it's... Uh, Fantastic resource put together by a collection of some of the best minds in the field that have to battle it out and come to some kind of agreement on, you know, what is what is the takeaway messages on how the best way to feed dairy cattle. So, yeah, great. All right. Second question. What's your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture? <laughs> that was, I'm not a heavy reader, but I, I like to learn more about different cultures, different landscapes of, of the world. So, I um whenever I get chance I I I try to read um National um Geography magazine and also the channel watch channel to you know know more about you know the cultures and landscape and wildlife in the world so that's something I I, I like to do yeah absolutely okay lastly in your opinion what sets successful dairy professionals apart from those who are less successful. You know, success is a complicated trait, right, to define. But uh, based on my observations, um, I think the having um, sound scientific knowledge, 
the foundation is very important to be successful. I mean, if you are nutrition, uh, applied knowledge versus basic, you know, both are very important. Uh, like, you know, the what is the science behind um, the nutrition. I think that's very important. And then um, not only that, but I think, um, you know, having been mentored and challenged by successful dairy professional is another key, you know, the mentoring, what kind of mentoring you receive, what kind of challenge you you kind of, you know, had to overcome, you know, during that interaction between you and your mentor is also very important for you to be shaped up to be a successful um, scientist in dairy science. I believe that. I mean, that's that's what I think. Yes. Good thoughts. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Ranga Apuhami, thank you so much for joining us on the Dairy Podcast Show. <laughs> thank you for inviting. It was a very enjoyable experience. <laughs> thank you, Barry. You bet. And that's been another episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. If you haven't subscribed yet, hit the button before you forget, and we'll see you next time.